The organized resistance at Heart Mountain has to be differentiated from the resistance that took place in 1942. Uh, the war was not over, but clearly the United States was over the hump. Large numbers of Japanese Americans had already been released from camp to work, to go to college, and to do something, and to do other kinds of things. Some had joined MIS. There were volunteers for the Army starting in 1943. But when the draft was instituted, and this was after the so-called loyalty tests, uh, there were some people initially in Heart Mountain, later at Post and a few other camps, there, was a, there were a minority of people who said they did not think it was appropriate to apply selective service procedures to persons who were behind barbed wire and deprived of large amounts of their normal constitutional rights to life, liberty, etc. These have been confused by some people with persons who had said no, no on the so-called loyalty uh, questionnaires, questions 27 and 28. But these were people who had said yes, yes, because people who said, at least the males of draft age, who said no, no, were not subject to the draft. So these were people who had already attested their loyalty to the United States, had already said that they were not... Uh, in a state of allegiance to the emperor of Japan. But they did protest, and they said, we shall not go, we will not go, and some of them actually refused to get on the buses to take them for their draft physicals. Even the selective service system understood that it wasn't right to give people draft physicals inside of concentration camps. Uh, although this meant that the Japanese-American draft resistors, as opposed to other kinds of draft resistors, had to decide to resist the draft before they knew whether they were going to pass their physicals or not, whereas most people could take a physical, then go back home and wait to see the result, and then get a call for induction. The JCL and the American Civil Liberties Union uh, opposed this resistance, vilified and later ignored, which is, I think, even worse. Uh, those who did resist, uh, almost 300 actually went to federal penitentiary uh, for draft resistance, 260-odd inside the camp. Their legal status uh, was that they were people who were convicted, tried, indicted, tried, convicted, served some of their sentences, and were later pardoned. What was unpardonable, I think, was the fact that for a long, long time they were simply erased from Japanese-American history and were unknown from memory. I will never forget uh, my shock and surprise at the successful way in which this had been suppressed. This had been uh, just sort of, uh, you know, written written out of history. It had gone into what George Orwell uh, would call in 1948 a memory hole. Uh, but happily, uh, there were ways to reach into the memory hole and, and pull it out. And by now, uh, I think everyone who is interested in the uh, question, does any serious reading about the uh, Japanese-American experiences, is, is now aware of the dimensions of this protest. I never expected to find no protest. But I really was surprised. Remember, this is 1970. This is a uh, quarter of a century after, after it's over. I was really surprised to discover that this kind of a well-organized movement, a mass trial for draft resistance of 63 people, that's still the largest mass trial for draft resistance in our history, that this could be absolutely ignored, that, you could, that, that, that it could have, have, as it were, almost disappeared without trace unless you went back beyond the other accounts. And there had been, I'm not going to list them now, but uh, there had been any number of books written about the uh, Japanese-American experience, some by insiders who knew very well what had happened. And uh, although I don't do oral history in the formal sense, I've over the years talked to and made notes on 
discussions with about 2,000 individual Japanese Americans, and I've got them arranged in various ways. And uh, on one of my trips back to Los Angeles, after I discovered the draft resistance, I went to to see some of my Heart Mountain informants, a couple, and I would get the, and I would, I didn't start out, why didn't you tell me about because that's not the way you work with people. But I, I went back, I asked them about this and that, in one or two cases I said, look, I found this about you, or I found this about your son, or about your brother uh, in, the, in the Heart Mountain Sentinel, because I Xeroxed a lot of stuff. Uh, and then I would ask, what about the, that draft resistant movement, the fair play movement? And I would get answers like, oh, that. Yes, I remember that. That was so unpleasant. You wanted to know about that? I'm sorry. You know, uh, if I had known, I would have told you. But I didn't think it was important. I think it was important to understand that the Japanese people, like almost any other segment of the American people, were not a monolithic group, everybody doing the same, and that there was a dissent tradition. Later, this became much more important when, uh, partially as a result of the civil rights movement and the great society programs, and even more as a result of our misbegotten war in Vietnam and the eventual reactions against it, that suddenly protest became in, as in the 50s, protest was out. And I think it was very important for uh, younger Japanese Americans, the Sansei, even the Yonsei, uh, to understand that there had been uh, a minority protest movement, and protest movements are by definition minority movements, but that, that even at the time when apparently there was more consensus among the Japanese American people than any other, that there was a protest movement and that this is an important part of Japanese American history and of the traditions of the Japanese American people, and to ignore it is to, uh, is to distort that history.